The law of non-contradiction is foundational to logic. It states that something cannot be true and not true at the same time. Something can't exist and not exist at the same time, and something can't belong to a group and not belong to a group at the same time. There's a variety of ways of saying it, but it's all the same principle. There cannot be contradiction. Contradiction in the most formal sense is simply P and not P, or premise and then the negation of that premise. Now this law is so obvious, intuitive, and necessary for anything to make sense that it's just assumed to be true. Many believe that it's so self-evident that it doesn't need a proof. It is self-evident, but there must be a proof that it's self-evident. Otherwise, how do we distinguish between things that are self-evident and things that are not? We need a way of explaining why this is self-evident while this is not. It's like, could I just make up a word, glub glosh, and then assert that that's self-evident? No, I would need to explain it. And this is true for any proposition. Consider the following. War is wrong. Is that self-evident? It might be true, but is it self-evidently true? Or is it true because of a previous premise, which may or may not be self-evident? For the sake of argument, we can even assume that it is self-evident that war is wrong, and then compare that with a statement that is not self-evident, like, it will rain tomorrow. Why is this not self-evident while this is? You need to explain what the difference is. And so there's a very big problem in just asserting that something is true without giving an explanation. And this is a problem that I have with a lot of the philosophical discourse surrounding axioms. Many people think that an axiom is something that you can just assume to be true without needing a justification, which is intellectually pathetic and a misconception of what makes something truly axiomatic. If something is axiomatic, you need to prove it. For example, in my video on morality, I explained why truth is intrinsic, axiomatic, and self-evident. I didn't just assert it and then justify that baseless assumption by calling it an axiom. That'd be ridiculous. I proved it. Truth is intrinsic because it is impossible for truth to not exist. If it's true that truth does not exist, then truth does exist, because it would be true that truth does not exist. Truth is self-evident. And so if we're going to regard the law of non-contradiction to be self-evident, axiomatic, and intrinsic, then we need to be able to prove it, and we can. We'll start by assuming that the law of non-contradiction does not exist. It's false. Statements can contradict. The question then becomes, what about that statement? If there's no law of non-contradiction, then that should be allowed. So now it is both true that statements can contradict and statements cannot contradict. And this brings us to a very interesting double bind. Because if we allow that contradiction, if we allow both of those to be true, specifically the second one, that statements cannot contradict, then we instantly lose the ability to allow that contradiction. Because we have allowed it to be true that statements cannot contradict, and those are contradictory statements. So now only one of them can be true. But it doesn't matter which one is true. Because by only allowing one of them to be true, by rejecting the contradiction of the statement that statements can contradict, you are choosing that statements cannot contradict. Assuming that the law of non-contradiction does not exist results in an internal contradiction, which necessarily results in the law of non-contradiction existing. Now, not only that, but there's also an external contradiction that happens. Because if it is true that statements can contradict and cannot contradict, then that statement can contradict and cannot contradict. Which means that it is the case that statements can contradict and cannot contradict, and not the case that statements can contradict and cannot contradict. And if it is true that it is the case that statements can contradict and cannot contradict, and not the case that statements can contradict and not contradict, then that statement should be able to contradict and not contradict, and not be able to contradict and not contradict. Now, this will keep going on forever, exponentially growing in an infinite regression, in which the only way to stop it is to reject contradiction, which would collapse the entire argument and prove the law of non-contradiction. Now, this proof might be easier to understand if you see it in syllogistic form. We'll start with the first premise by assuming that premises can contradict. The second premise is that the first premise is a premise, because it is. Now, from that, we can conclude that the first premise can contradict, because the first premise is a premise and premises can contradict. Therefore, the first premise can contradict. Now, if the first premise can contradict, then we can derive the contradiction of premises can contradict, which is premises can contradict and cannot contradict. Now this brings us to a double bind, because if we allow this internal contradiction, then we allow it to be true that premises cannot contradict, which immediately means that we can't allow the contradiction, because we've just now allowed it to be true that premises cannot contradict. So now only one of them can be true, but it doesn't matter which one you pick, it'll be the same conclusion. If you pick that premises cannot contradict, then premises cannot contradict. If you pick that premises can contradict, well, you're still actually picking that premises cannot contradict at a meta level because you're rejecting the contradiction, right? You're saying that it is not the case that premises can contradict. So either premises cannot contradict or premises can contradict, in which case premises cannot contradict. 
And you can't just get out of this by saying that you allow contradiction. That was already assumed. The contradiction is not the problem. The problem is the double bind that arises from allowing the contradiction. If we allow this contradiction, then that means that they both have to be true. That's what a contradiction is. But in order for it to be true, that premises cannot contradict, there can be no contradiction. And if there can be, then it's not true that premises cannot contradict, in which case you're not allowing contradiction. In either scenario, premises cannot contradict. Assuming that premises can contradict leads to an internal contradiction, producing a double bind in which allowing contradiction means you can't. And if you can, then you aren't. Now, this is sufficient. It proves the law of non-contradiction. But we can also continue through external contradiction because 4 is itself a premise. And 4 states that premises can contradict and cannot contradict, which means that we can conclude, just as we did on line 3, that 4 can contradict and cannot contradict. Now, if it's true that 4 can contradict and cannot contradict, then we need to take 4, contradict it, and then contradict that. And that would be written as premises can contradict and cannot contradict. And then we need to bracket this because this is 4 and then negate it. It is not the case that premises can contradict and cannot contradict. And so now we have 4 and the negation of 4, but we also need to contradict that. So we need to put it in another layer of brackets and then negate that. It is not the case that it is the case that premises can contradict and cannot contradict and not the case that premises can contradict and cannot contradict. Now you can immediately notice that there's another internal contradiction, but obviously if we were going for the internal contradiction, we would have done it on line four. So instead we're going to trigger it through the external contradiction, which we can do because seven is itself a premise which means that we can apply it to itself. And this will keep going on forever, never reaching a conclusion unless we reject the premise and cut off the regress. Uh, for example, we might say, yes, four is a premise, but we're not going to let it apply to itself. So it is not the case that four can contradict and not contradict. Now, right off the bat, that's equivalent to saying that premises cannot contradict since we're denying the contradiction of this premise. But we can also further prove it by working backwards from within the statement. So since we aren't allowing contradiction, only one of these statements can be true. If we pick that 4 can contradict, which we've written out as a statement right here, well, this contains an internal contradiction. And if we allow it, then we allow it to be true that it is not the case that premises can contradict and cannot contradict. Which, if you just zoom out one level and look at the parentheses as terms, is the entire statement, premise, contradiction, premise, contradiction, right? This entire statement is saying that premises can contradict and cannot contradict. And if this statement is true, that it is not the case that premises can contradict and cannot contradict, then we can't allow both of them to be true. So now only one of these statements can be true. But again, it doesn't matter which one you pick. If you pick this one, you're actually picking this one. Because by only picking this statement, you are saying that it is not the case that premises can contradict and not contradict which is equivalent to saying it is not the case that premises can contradict and not contradict. So either way, you have to pick this option, but this option also contains an internal contradiction, which if we allow, means that we have to allow it to be true that premises cannot contradict, which means that we can't allow the contradiction, in which case we're right back to the proof at line four, right? Because now we have to pick. If premises cannot contradict, then premises cannot contradict. If premises can contradict, well, we're still actually picking that premises cannot contradict at a meta level because we're saying that it is not the case that premises can contradict. Now, if we back up a little bit and instead choose that premises cannot contradict, which we've written as a statement right here, well, right off the bat, that means that we can't have both of these because of the negation in front of it. It is not the case that it is the case that premises can contradict and not contradict, and not the case that premises can contradict and not contradict. So now only one of them can be true, but it doesn't matter which one you pick, you'll still be picking this one. Because again, if you just zoom out a level and look at the parentheses as terms, premise, contradiction, premise, contradiction, right? If you only pick this option and reject its contradiction, then you are saying that it is not the case that premises can contradict and cannot contradict, which is equivalent to saying it is not the case that premises can contradict and cannot contradict. So you have to pick this option, but this option contains an internal contradiction, which if we allow, we must allow it to be true that premises cannot contradict, which immediately means that we can't allow the contradiction, which brings us right back to the proof at line four. No matter what we choose, they all lead to the same conclusion. Premises cannot contradict. Now, you might ask, what if they don't stop the contradiction? What if they just bite the postmodern bullet and accept infinite regression? 
If they do that, then they disprove themselves, because an entity which infinitely regresses is essentially an entity which never actually exists, for the same reason that entities within a circular relationship never actually exist. For example, if we say that A is equal to B, and B is equal to A in terms of identity, not value, then neither A nor B ever actually exist. Because if we don't define A's identity except by B's identity, and we don't define B's identity except by A's identity, then A has no identity. And if A has no identity, then B has no identity. And if B has no identity, then A has no identity. Which means that neither A nor B ever actually exist. And so if the entity, premises can contradict, leads to an infinite regression of external contradiction and is never able to ground itself, then essentially it does not exist that premises can contradict. Which means that it is metaphysically impossible to hold the position that premises can contradict. Which proves that the law of non-contradiction is intrinsic, axiomatic, and self-evident. Now, there's multiple routes we could have gone with this proof and multiple ways we could have written it in terms of operators and connectors, but this raw logic should be sufficient to prove the law of non-contradiction. Thanks.